As I mentioned in class, there are a few things about ETFs that I wanted to uh, point out that I didn't mention. I would started talking about the pros and cons of ETFs, and um, I am fairly certain that I mentioned as a con that you cannot buy a partial share of an ETF. But as a pro, they charge lower management fees than corresponding mutual funds. For instance, Vanguard has the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, which has the goal of emulating the S&P 500. It has a, a fee of 0.17%, but Vanguard also has um, an S&P 500 ETF that that um, has the ticker VOO. It invests in the same portfolio stocks and the same weighting scheme, but its management fee is only 0.05%. So why might you buy the VFINX compared to the VU? The reason being, if you want to add more money to the mutual fund, you can add it in actually $1 increments. According to Morningstar, you need an initial 3000 to open and uh, buy into the VFINX, but once you get past that point, you can add money in very small increments, buying partial shares of the fund whenever you wish. You cannot buy partial ETFs, even through Vanguard. Um, Right now, I think VU is priced at about $175, so just to buy one share, you need a minimum of $175. Also, unless you buy VU through Vanguard, you may pay a commission on it. If you buy it through your regular stockbroker and it's not one of those commission-free funds, which it probably wouldn't be, um, you'd pay a $10 commission every time you made a purchase. So there are, are good arguments for buying the mutual fund versus buying the ETF. Like if you have a lot of money that you want to put in just as a lump sum and you're not really planning to make monthly contributions, buying the ETF makes more sense. You'll pay perhaps a $10 commission on that, but it's a $10 commission you only pay one time. If you're going to make monthly contributions in relatively small amounts, once you get past that $3,000 threshold, you need to open the account. Uh, the mutual fund might be a better idea. And then I'm not sure if I mentioned this part. Well, it's a pro. I'm not, I don't want to put it as a con. Um, it, it, ETFs cannot use enhanced indexing. I actually think that's a good thing because when I buy an index fund, I just want it to purely be an index fund and not gauge in any sort of active management. Okay, I didn't have much left to say for ETFs, and um, that's all there was. So for Chapter 4, um, I don't remember the exact title, but it relates to um, the different types of stock markets, and just the fact that we have a, a capital market and a money market, primary markets versus secondary markets. So let me talk just a bit about money markets. Money markets are where short-term debt instruments are traded. So basically treasury securities um, negotiable CDs commercial paper that's issued by financially strong corporations. All that sort of stuff is traded in the money market. The capital markets are where um, longer term debt instruments and equities are traded. And then there's also their primary market. That's when a company 
uh, like GoPro that goes public and they issue securities to help finance their growth. They receive, when they issue those securities in the primary market, they receive cash in exchange for issuing those securities. However, once their securities start trading in the secondary market where like I might buy them from you, GoPro doesn't get any of that money. We're just exchanging money among investors. So in primary markets, the issuers of securities receive sun funds from selling securities, whether it's stocks or bonds. And in the secondary market, investors trade securities among themselves. Without the existence of a good secondary market, it would be difficult to sell securities in the primary market. If when GoPro was trying to go public in the primary market, it was if, if there wasn't a secondary market, you'd be it'd be difficult to try to find buyers in the primary market because when they were ready to sell, they'd have to find their own buyers. But since there's a secondary market and people who buy stuff in the primary market can just contact their broker and say, all right, I'm ready to sell. And and the broker can find buyers within moments. Um, that encourages people to buy securities in the primary market. The secondary markets are broken into two different types. They Some books call them, um, let's see, organized versus, oh, what is they call, I can't think of the other word, they don't call them unorganized, oh, over-the-counter, uh, but they're also called uh, broker versus dealer markets, and I think the, the books are moving toward the term, terms broker versus dealer nowadays. And then the New York Stock Exchange is probably the best known broker market. But um, basically it's an organized exchange. Companies have to meet certain listing requirements. And there are a lot of listing requirements. I don't need you to know all of them by any means, but basically they they require, for, for instance, that a firm be of a certain size. It has to have a certain level of assets, a certain level of income, and they also want a certain level of trading volume. This is probably not really a good way to phrase it, but they require that there be a minimum number of stockholders, that the stockholders own a minimum number of securities. What they're trying to accomplish here is trading. The secondary market works because there are different investors who want to trade with each other. If a company went public and only had a hundred different stockholders, on any given day maybe none of those stockholders want to sell. So if nobody wants to sell, then nobody can buy. But if there are 500,000 stockholders on any given day, some of those stockholders are going to want to sell. So if others want to buy, there are shares available to be sold. So here I'm going to put min number of shareholders and also minimum number of uh, shares of stock, for example. And there are other listing requirements too. The New York Stock Exchange kind of prides itself on being the best stock exchange in the world, meaning there's um, a lot of trading that occurs. There won't be stocks that don't have a lot of volume. There, there won't be stocks where you're hard pressed to um, be able to sell them if you wish. Sometimes when you trade stocks, there might not, as I mentioned, be people interested in buying it if you're trying to sell. So it might be tough to find a, a buyer. But that shouldn't happen on the New York Stock Exchange unless you're trying to sell many, many, many shares of stock. But even then, it 
may well not happen because the New York Stock Exchange uses the services of a specialist firm. And the, one of the jobs of a specialist firm is to make a market in a security. So what that means is if there aren't enough buyers, the specialist has to buy. The specialist has to stand ready to buy. And if there aren't enough sellers, the seller has sorry, the specialist has to stand ready to sell from its inventory. And this essentially happens every day because like today there might be orders to buy um, I don't know a million one hundred and eighty nine thousand shares for a particular stock but there might only be orders to sell just to make the math easy I'm just gonna make that a million a million shares so there are people interested in buying hundred eighty nine thousand more shares than there are people interested in selling and in no day are the orders going to be perfectly matched. So the specialist has to stand ready to um, sell 189,000 shares from their inventory. So a specialist has an inventory of the stock that they're a specialist in. And a specialist could be a specialist in more than one stock. And many of them are. But according to some research that I read, about 86% of the trading on the New York Stock Exchange does not involve a specialist. So basically what I mean is they're able to match 86% of the orders, and with the other 14%, the specialist has to step in because there's not enough buyers or there's not enough sellers. And there is a limit to the market that the specialist has to make. So let's say a stock has some really negative news and there are lots and lots and lots of people interested in selling. At that point there are usually many people who are interested in buying but the number of shares wanting to be sold probably far outweighs the number of shares that are desired to be purchased. And what would happen in that case is that they would, uh, the specialists would meet with the administrators of the New York Stock Exchange and they would probably decide to halt trading on that particular stock just because there was such a negative event and it's causing such havoc. Because the specialist doesn't have to stand ready to buy an unlimited number of shares. So in dire cases, trading for a specific company would be halted. Just perhaps for an hour or maybe for the rest of the day. In extreme situations they actually will close the market. If the market is crashing horribly, there's something called a circuit breaker. So like in electricity, I don't know a whole lot about electricity, but if something happens and there's a surge of power, the circuit breaker cuts the current. In the stock market, if the stock market starts dropping a huge amount, I think it's about 10%, but I would really have to look up the uh, actual uh, percentages. And if it's a certain time of day, they will either close the market for like 10 minutes or 30 minutes or the rest of the day if the market is closed, if it's almost time for the market to close anyway. Um, and that's just trying to give people time to step back, rethink their, their situation and maybe uh, let the market calm down some. So this is a circuit breaker for the overall market. And, and sometimes when really horrible things happen, like when 9-11 happened, obviously that was in New York City and the New York Stock Exchange lost power and, and they just kept it closed for the whole week. But they closed the stock markets in other areas of the country too because they weren't sure how other markets would react and they just wanted us to have time to 
I guess calm down would be a good phrase. When Kennedy was shot, they closed the markets for trading. And there have been a few other instances, but I can't think of them right now. Now, the over-the-counter market has actually changed a lot in the last 30 years. And the prime player in that is the NASDAQ which stands for the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. And it is basically just a network of computers. So while the New York Stock Exchange has a centralized location and all the trading prior to computers actually occurred in that building, um, for the NASDAQ market, the trading has never occurred in a specific building. It's always been via computer. And with the New York Stock Exchange and, and organized markets or broker markets, what the broker is trying to do is just exchange, you know, have, have a place for people who want to sell shares match up with people who want to buy shares. The over-the-counter market doesn't work that way at all. The over-the-counter market is a dealer market. So basically you have a network of securities dealers, that's the SD, who are interested in trading securities, specific securities. So maybe I'm a dealer for Microsoft and I only want to trade Microsoft securities. And the way I make my money is the difference between the bid ask price. I'm actually going to pop over to uh, Yahoo. So if I look right here, I can see that there is an order to, or a, a dealer who is willing to buy 2,000 shares of Microsoft at $50.46 and then a dealer who's willing to sell shares of Microsoft, a hundred of them, for fifty dollars and fifty cents. The difference, this could be the same dealer, or maybe it isn't, um, but, but essentially every dealer is going to have a higher ask price. The price they're asking you to pay if you wish to wish to purchase, then they have bid price, which is the price they are willing to pay to buy them from you. So here, the bid ask spread is the four cents, the a four cent difference. And so, because these dealers are trading many many shares in a given day, the four cent uh, profit per share starts to add up over time. And that's how uh, dealers on the NASDAQ make money. So they make money by having a lower bid price. Uh, my space bar is not working very well. Then ask price. The NASDAQ has multiple tiers. Um, they actually have, if, if y'all remember or noticed this on your project, they have the, the GM, there's also the GS, and then the CM. Those are just different tiers. This is the global market, this is the global select market, and this is the capital market. And they just differ by their listing requirements. The NASDAQ used to be, like 30 years ago or so, considered, it used to be considered kind of a low-grade place for your securities to trade. They didn't have as good of a computer equipment. It took trades longer to happen. I believe the cost of trading was higher on the NASDAQ. But since about 1987, there was a, a stock market crash in October of 87. And trades were taking like an hour and a half to actually happen because when there's a crash there's a usually a, a huge amount of volume that occurs and none of the stock markets were prepared to handle all that volume so after that happened all the exchanges upgraded their computer equipment and the NASDAQ really worked hard to boost its image um, and make that make it worthwhile of, of receiving a better reputation. And so now it's it's 
sort of on par with the New York Stock Exchange. And what companies used to try to do was they'd start out small, they didn't meet the listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange, so they would just be listed on the NASDAQ. But as they got larger and met the listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange, they would switch because it was just perceived to, to be more influential to have your stock traded on the New York Stock Exchange. That's not necessarily the case at all anymore, and there are lots of companies that meet the listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange but ought to stay on the NASDAQ. Microsoft is one uh, really well-known example. Alright, that's actually it for um, my little supplemental lecture.